Welcome to Michigan State University's Student Life Series. My name is Molly Barnes. I work out of the Office of Admissions as an admissions counselor here at Michigan State. In today's series, we will be covering Michigan State's living learning communities. Today, we are joined by the Honors College, along with our three degree-granting residential colleges. That includes James Madison, Residential College of Arts and Humanities, and also Lyman Briggs. Let's get this series started. I'd like to introduce all of you to Andrew Abad. He is the Assistant Director of Admissions over in the Honors College. Andrew, take it away. Thanks, Molly. My name is Andrew Abad, and I serve as the Assistant Director of Admissions for the MSU Honors College. Uh, we are a smaller group on campus, about 4,000 students on a campus of 40,000 undergraduates, and we are really um, meant to give you a little bit more flexibility and allow you to personalize your MSU experience a little bit more. So let me show you a little bit what that looks like. As you can see on the slide here, our students can choose from over 200 majors on the university's campus. So we have about 240 academic programs in total. Um, many of our students will choose to double major or double minor. Um, you can do any of the three residential colleges you'll hear about later. Um, but we allow our students to really design their own program. So in addition to waiving most of our course prerequisites, we also allow you to make substitutions in courses in what we call integrative studies or general education classes at MSU. Um, some of those classes may be otherwise restricted for maybe juniors and seniors only or majors only, but as an honors college student, you'll have the ability to take those classes from your first semester on. So we give you a lot of flexibility to determine not only what classes you wanna take, but when you wanna take them. We have a number of ways to achieve honors credit um, some of you may be taking AP, IB, dual enrollment courses. We have honors courses that we offer within the university that are smaller. They're taught by faculty uh, across a variety of departments. So in many cases, it's not just the math and science, although we have plenty of those, um, but honors courses in history and in English, um, a lot of different ways, but they are in many ways similar to an AP class in that they are a little bit more accelerated. Um, we do allow what's called an honors option, which is where you take an existing MSU class and do a little bit of extra work for honors credit. Um, but one really exciting thing is that we allow our students to actually take graduate level classes. So as an honors college student, you'll be able to do that. Um, some of our students will do undergraduate research all four years. Um, that would usually culminate in a senior project or a thesis. Um, and you may be wondering what the three and eight on this slide mean. Um, these simply correspond to our honors requirements. So we ask you to do three honors classes um, by the end of your um, sophomore year, which would be your fourth semester, so three of those, and then eight honors classes by the time that you graduate. And you can see that picture in the bottom right. That's uh, our great director of advising. Uh, we have a great advising team that works with you every step of the way to make sure not only you have the classes that you need each semester, but that you're planning these things out as you go forward. We do have a number of high impact experiences that you'll get involved with in the honors college outside of the classroom. So first and foremost, uh, education abroad is a really big thing that we do at MSU. We're top five in the country in terms of the number of programs we have. We have about 275 study abroad programs. Um, many of our students will do research abroad. So our honor students have access to the Euro Scholars Research Program. Um, we also have a number of ways to get involved here on campus. So you'll see that picture in the top right. Um, that is our HC Impact Group. That's about 40 of our incoming students who actually move into campus a little bit early each year. And they do that um, really to get a better sense of our community. So they spend a lot of time in the Lansing and East Lansing area. Each day is with a different nonprofit, uh, learning a little bit about the work that they do. Uh, and it really ties well into the service learning mission of the Honors College. And this experience in particular actually ties to a course that you would take in the fall. So that's a great opportunity. And I know many of you are doing service already in your school. So if you'd like to continue that, the Honors College is a great place. And again, as I mentioned, undergraduate research, this is something that I think um, can be one of the most important experiences you'll have at MSU. We have a very special program within the Honors College called the Professorial Assistantship, where you'll actually be paired with a faculty member in your first two years. So uh, your freshman and sophomore year, you'll have a guaranteed research assistantship. Uh, and this is a limited program, but for the students who complete it, you have the ability to do research all four years on campus and to really have uh, a good sense of what you wanna do and, and have the ability to try new things, which I think is really important. We have optional honors housing on campus, so you'll hear a little bit about some of the different facilities uh, with the residential colleges, but we have honors space in all three of those in addition to other honors uh, floors across campus. 
We do have a number of student organizations as well. So just to give you a sense of what some of these are, uh, Honors Times Two is our mentoring organization. So students will go to a local elementary school and uh, mentor students in math. Mosaic is our multicultural organization. We have just new this year, our Students of Color Coalition. Um, and the Honors College also has a number of social events. So we'll have an annual picnic. We have a, a number of speakers and faculty who will come and do different chats um, throughout the year. You may be wondering at this point, okay, the Honors College, you're taking honors classes, you're going abroad, you're doing research, you might be living on an honors floor. Um, what does that mean for me once I graduate, right? If you're thinking about medical school or law school or just getting a first job after graduation, how do our honor students do in that market? So uh, that's a great question. And to answer it, we've used uh, a pretty recent survey of our graduates. This is a survey of our 2019 graduating class. And what we found was that about 40%, and sometimes this, this can be closer to half, but about 40% of our honors college graduates um, will go straight to graduate school. So you can see some of the institutions listed here. Um, we also have a 96% job placement rate. So there are a number of uh, our students who are entering some of these employers listed on the, the slide and others. So we have a lot of great opportunities for you. I think a lot of the things that you do while you're in the Honors College, so as we talk about research or internships, um, taking honors classes, those can all certainly help prepare you for what comes next, whatever that looks like. So for scholarships, I know many of you are thinking of applying to MSU. Some of you may already have been uh, accepted to MSU, so congratulations if you have. Um, we have a number of scholarships available for honors college students specifically. So um, in our incoming freshman scholarships, we have both an in-state and an out-of-state award. In fact, for out-of-state students, we have two different awards depending on the price level. So there is a higher dollar amount award called the Honors Excellence Scholarship. Uh, I mentioned the professorial assistantship. Again, that's a limited program. About 25 to 30 percent of our incoming students will receive one of those. Um, our big scholarship competition is called ADS, the Alumni Distinguished Scholarship Competition. Um, that will be two weekends. Typically, uh, it'll be the end of January, early February. I don't think we've finalized the dates for that yet. But uh, in that competition, we award our full rides. There are about 15 ADS scholars each year. We have about 25 full tuition scholarships and then about 120 scholarships awarded in total. And that's in collaboration with the Office of Admissions. Um, we do have a number of current student scholarships as well. So some of them may be related to a program, um, but most of them will be to support those high impact experiences. So if you'd like to go abroad, if you'd like to do a research project, um, each spring you can apply using the MSU scholarship database. So for admissions, um, the Honors College is by invitation only. There is not a separate application or anything else you would need to do. So all you need to do is fill out that MSU application. Um, November 1st is MSU's big priority scholarship deadline. So we certainly recommend that you get that application in by November 1st. Um, but what we'll do is as soon as you're admitted to the university, we then receive your information and consider you separately for an honors college invitation. So what we're looking at, we're gonna look at your GPA, we're going to look at your curriculum rigor, what classes you're taking, how are you doing in those challenging classes. Um, we are test optional this year, so if you decide to send a test score, we'll certainly consider that, but otherwise you do not need it um, for admission or scholarships for the Honors College. So we do not need a test score this year. Um, we do have a pathway program called the Academic Scholars Program that is open to a few students. Um, that's a pathway program into the Honors College, so you may receive information on that. Um, and then if you don't end up joining us, maybe your grades are a little bit low in high school or um, you've decided not to attend the Honors College immediately, you can come to MSU and be considered again after your first semester. So those who come into MSU and do really well, um, they may join us in early February. Um, so at this point, uh, again, we hope that you keep in touch with us. Um, again, my name is Andrew Abad. I'm the Assistant Director of Admissions. Dr. Bess German is our Assistant Dean. Um, you can email us and our main email is honors at msu.edu. Um, but other than that, I'll go ahead and pass it to Lindsay from James Madison. Thanks.
Hello, my name is Lindsay Snyder, and I am the Assistant Director of Undergraduate Affairs at James Madison College. And as you can see on the screen, Amelia Hammond, our Recruitment Coordinator, was planning to be with you here today. Um, however, uh, she got called away uh, on an unexpected emergency, and so I will be filling in for her today. Um, I want to start by talking a little bit about what a residential college is. So you are going to hear from um, several different representatives representatives from the residential colleges um, throughout this presentation who are going to sort of take a deep dive into their particular programs. But we thought it was a good idea to start with just a general overview of what is a residential college and what makes that option unique at Michigan State. So there are three of these programs at the university. They are degree granting colleges, meaning that your major is housed within the college. We have our own faculty uh, and your degree um, is conferred through the college. Um, the first is Lyman Briggs College, which focuses on the natural sciences, James Madison College, uh, where I work, um, which focuses on public and international affairs, and then the residential college in arts and humanities. And again, you're going to hear from representatives um, that will go into greater detail about about each of these programs should you have interest. Um, but we wanna talk just in general about the larger concept of the residential college um, before we get into the specifics. So when you think about your major at Michigan State University, um, each major is housed within a college. And so a typical major at MSU is housed in a college. So perhaps you're studying elementary education as a part of the uh, College of Education, or you're an engineering major as part of the College of Engineering. You would be housed in a building on campus um, and you uh, would be within a neighborhood and uh, you would then travel um, throughout the week to uh, meet with professors or to attend class or to have an academic advising appointment um, and then go back to the building on campus where you reside um, and have the sort of living part of your MSU experience. But the residential colleges, we try to tie those two things together. So our students are housed within a particular building on campus that is dedicated for the residential college. In our case, we're housed in Case Hall. And that means that in Case Hall, um, our students live on several of the floors that look like any other residential uh, building on campus um, where they are able to make those sort of connections, do their laundry, eat lunch, all of the things that happen in a normal um, residential space on campus. But the uh, part of our building is dedicated to the college. So you'll also find our faculty um, and their offices are right there on the third floor of Case Hall. All of our advisors have offices right there. Our classrooms are actually housed right in the building as well. So our students are sort of sharing this space um, and uh, it makes it really easy to navigate um, and to sort of build community right when you um, uh, get on campus, um, which sometimes for students when they're looking at a, a college the size of MSU, which is a very large school, um, and it can be intimidating and you're wondering how you're going to find your place, how you're going to find a sense of community, um, how you'll feel connected. And a residential college is a great way to sort of have this sort of smaller, um, more intimate interaction, um, but do so in the middle of one of the biggest schools in the country with all of the benefits that come along with being at a big school like Michigan State. Um, so when you think outside of just sort of the physical format of the residential colleges, many of the majors housed within the residential colleges tend to be a little bit more interdisciplinary. They look at um, bringing together different things that you might find on campus. Um, they bring together faculty with a wide range of backgrounds and trainings that then encourage students to think about things in different ways or ask you to um, think uh, and propose different questions to the topics and issues that you might be examining in class. Um, and uh, I think in general, um, the students who are attracted to residential colleges are interested in the ways that the fields of study that they're interested in, whether that's the natural sciences or the arts or international relations, the way that this impacts society um, and the way that we see this playing out in the world that we live in and what's happening in our world today. 
So the residential colleges are all freshman admit programs, and these programs um, are uh, majors and, and colleges that you need to apply for at the time that you apply to Michigan State um, as we are filling our classes with incoming students every year. Um, and so each college will talk a little bit more about how you apply and how you go through the process. But it's important that you start to sort out sort of what you envision for your MSU experience and what you want your day-to-day -day, um, uh, classroom experience and residential experience to look like when you're on campus. Because some of the programs, like the residential colleges, ask you to make this declaration um, and commitment early on in this initial process as you're applying to the university. So we want to make sure that you're fully informed of your options and that you understand the wide variety of um, sort of setups and situations that you might find yourself in or available to you as a student at Michigan State University. So in summary, if you're looking at, at the university and thinking that there's definitely aspects of a large uh, university that are attractive to you, whether that's the vast amount of research opportunities for undergraduate students or Big Ten football or the very large campus or being connected to uh, the state capitol just down the street or any of the other things that make Michigan State a really uh, exciting, vibrant community. But there's a part of it that seems very large to you, um, and there's some concern there. The residential colleges can be a good way to sort of have that smaller community while at the same time um, being able to take advantage of all of the great things that MSU has to offer. So we sort of like to say that it's the best of both worlds. And with that, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what James Madison focuses on before turning it over to my colleagues from the other two residential colleges. So um, in James Madison, we focus on public and international affairs. So while the students who come to James Madison might traditionally be looking at majors in things like political science or history, economics, sociology, anthropology, um, and any of the other social sciences. James Madison tends to bring these things together into um, the study of public affairs. So we are looking at the major political, social, and legal issues affecting the world, both historically and um, in, in current affairs. We do offer um, four different majors that we'll get into a little bit later, but I wanted to talk to you about um, first sort of what students are doing um, after graduation, as that's always an important um, uh, question that students have. So um, the residential colleges across the board have very high uh, graduation placement rates, and we wanted to make sure that you had our uh, most recent data, which is uh, 2019 data. So we had 95% of our students from the class of 2019 placed within six months of graduation. Um, and this is also with a 99% response rate. So we know that this is really good data. This is almost our entire class. Um, a couple examples of places that people are working from that class. We have folks working for the state of Michigan, for the federal government, um, Amazon, Michigan Public Health Institute. We know that about 25% of our students continued their education immediately after graduation, and about half of those students went to law school. And you can see on your screen, we had students going um, to MSU College of Law, U of M, Boston College, Harvard, um, Texas, uh, and University of Chicago. And we had an average starting salary of $47,000. Um, one of the things that we like to do is to make sure that students have good uh, and easy access to the sort of information that allows them to see what sort of opportunities are available to them after graduation. You can see a few links on your screen to um, the destination surveys that we uh, 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 make public. Um, so you can view those on our website. So if you want to see any of the uh, past years, you can see a full list of what students are doing and where they're going. Now, I promised you I'd talk a little bit about the majors that we offer. We do have four majors. And um, the first one that I'll talk a little bit about is our international relations major. Um, this is the major, I think, that a lot of students coming into the college uh, initially sort of gravitate to in the sense that it sort of uh, is something they're very familiar with. Um, it focuses on international security and conflict resolution, um, international political economy, and global governance. We look at foreign policy making in the U.S 
in other nation states. And we look at comparative regional and cultural factors that impact international politics and economics. Of the four majors that we offer, uh, this major has the most economics involved. Um, and it really does look at sort of uh, what is happening in the world with everything from the causes of war and conflict uh, to some of those uh, more economic uh, focused um, issues. The next uh, major that um, students are uh, able to select from is our social relations and policy major. It's also a very popular major in the college. This major looks mostly at um, what is happening um, in the social policy world, um, focused both in the U.S. and internationally over time. The courses in this major look at issues related to sociology and history and politics of group relations. And it really asks the question of sort of how do groups, both in the United States and abroad um, experience policy based on things like race, class, faith, gender, ethnicity, um, and uh, a look at identity interactions. Um, this major looks uh, really closely at all of the things happening in the United States right now. So all the major Supreme Court decisions and all of the public policy issues that we're debating, whether it's public health or uh, public education, um, all of the sort of hot button issues of the day um, this major is examining. The next major is political theory and constitutional democracy. Um, and this major explores fundamental questions like what are the rights and responsibilities of good citizens? What is the best way to live uh, for society as a whole? Uh, so these are sort of more philosophical conversations, right? Um, students will um, study the origin of democracy from ancient ancient um, Greek political thought to its contemporary manifestations and focuses on comparing historical ideals of democracy with the various challenges to those ideals uh, and looking more at contemporary American politics and its connection to those democratic ideals. Now, a lot of students think that this is the major um, if you're considering law school, which um, a lot of our um, our students are considering, but the reality is that all of our majors produce about the same number of students who attend law school. So all of these majors can be a great preparation for law school. Um, the last major I wanna talk about is our comparative cultures and politics major. This is our newest major and it's very exciting. Um, sort of takes this sort of international approach um, to looking at the way that culture and politics intersect. So there's a sort of complex relationship between these two things and understanding the history of people in a particular region and the dynamics between different groups of people can better help students understand um, what's happening politically in any particular region. Um, so students within this major select a particular area or issue to focus on so that they can really become knowledgeable about all of the dynamics that take place um, when you're thinking about about um, public policy and how to establish policies that work in a region um, when there's all sort of different sort of cultural dynamics happening um, that impact the success of any policy that's put into place. So all four of these majors um, have similarities and differences, and they're really working on building a very similar set of skills in students um, so that you are ready to go out into the world and tackle some of the biggest problems facing um, the world today, whether it's something happening in your local community that you're passionate about, or whether it's something happening halfway across the world that you really want to become engaged in. Um, students do not all have the same interest and focus when they come to James Madison, but the thing that brings them together is that they care about what's happening in the world. They want to understand the history of these situations, conflicts, and problems, and then work to become the problem solvers um, that help make these situations better. Um, so obviously with the international um, focus and the amount of students who come to James Madison interested in international issues, education abroad is a huge component of the um, of our uh, curriculum. Um, you can see on your screen a list of internships abroad and study abroad programs um, that are offered in a variety of different um, structures and settings and locations. So not only do you have the opportunity to take a class in another country or at another international institution, but you can also have an internship, a work experience abroad, um, which is a great opportunity for students who are looking to have that be a part of their future plans. Um, 
here is on your screen is an example of some of the different institutions and organizations where students have interned. As part of your curriculum at James Madison College, you have a required field experience, which is either a full semester internship or an education abroad experience. And we have a director of field experience who will help you think about the hundreds of different options that you have available to you, whether it's staying local and working at the state capitol just down the street um, in an interning um, capacity, or whether it's going to a complete different part of the world and, and using language skills that you've acquired during your time at MSU um, to uh, help you um, in an international internship. Um, but these are just an example. Um, and we have a full database on our website of the different locations where students have interned um, if you're interested in checking that out. If you want to look at the variety of different um, diversity, inclusion, and student engagement opportunities, um, James Madison College um, and our um, neighborhood uh, has a really vibrant community uh, with a lots of the host of different opportunities for students to get involved in. You can see on your screen a variety of different student organizations that are connected to the college, um, both in a um, sort of social and community building um, uh, opportunity, but also in a uh, sense that they are uh, sort of serving as advisors to the college, uh, the dean, um, the staff there, um, and working really closely as we um, develop um, the community that is James Madison College. All right, um, so I'm going to sort of skip ahead here to talk a little bit about applying to James Madison College. I mentioned that all of the residential colleges are freshman admit programs, um, and we want you to declare your interest at the time that you apply to MSU. The way that you would do this for James Madison College um, is by selecting James Madison College as your preferred major. Uh, as I mentioned, we have four majors in the college, and each of these majors, um, you will have the opportunity to explore more during your first year at James Madison. So as a first year student in James Madison College, um, you would um, uh, be listed as a James Madison College major. And then at the end of your first year, you would actually uh, be able to select one of the majors moving forward. Um, the uh, So on your uh, application MSU, you'll select James Madison College as your preferred major. We would appreciate if you can apply early of, uh, in the fall of your senior year because of the limited enrollment that I mentioned. However, we are first come first serve, so there's no additional criteria that we're looking for on your application. Uh, no higher GPA or test scores required for admission, um, but we do have space for the first 320 students um, to be admitted. So our class every year is about 320. Um, we have a total of about 1,200 students in the college. So we're really looking forward to connecting with you, learning more um, about what interests you, helping you find your home at Michigan State, whether it's through James Madison College or another uh, college or program um, available to you. You'll see on the screen Amelia's information. Um, feel free to reach out. She's always happy to meet individually with families to schedule a call. Um, and uh, there's a couple websites, um, both social media and some blogs you can check out to sort of get uh, a better idea of what our students are experiencing right now and those who are uh, with us um, and who have already started and to give you a better idea of what you could expect as a student. So thank you for your time. And I will turn it over to Sahar. Hi everyone and welcome to tonight's presentation. My name is Sahar Mahmood. I am a recruitment coordinator and academic advisor for the Residential College in the Arts and Humanities. Um, so in-house we say ARCA. Um, you'll hear RCAH, you'll hear the whole name Residential College in the Arts and Humanities. Um, so we have a variety of, um, well I'm going to start over folks. Jesus. Okay. Hi everyone and welcome to tonight's presentation. My name is Sahar Mahmoud and I am an academic advisor and recruitment coordinator for the Residential College in the Arts and Humanities. In-house we say ARCA, you'll hear RCAH, but it stands for Residential College in the Arts and Humanities. And we like to break that down into two things. So first is the residential college piece and then second is what we study, Arts and Humanities. Pretty simple. 
Um, and what it is, it's a living learning environment. So students who choose to study the arts and humanities live in our buildings of Snyder and Phillips Halls. Um, they take classes there, their professors are there, their academic advisors are there. Essentially everything they would need to be successful is one building. Um, and we call that the best of both worlds because we're essentially a small private liberal arts college feel within the Big Ten University. Um, Michigan State has a lot to offer that comes with the Big Ten, whether it be study abroad opportunities, football games, library resources, and then we offer the small pieces of where your professors know your name, your academic advisors know your name, you know, somebody like myself who recruits a student gets to know you from day one in high school all the way up until you graduate and afterwards. Um, so you really get the best of both worlds of like that small tight knit community and then the resources that come with the Big Ten University. So residential colleges don't mean that you are excluded to the rest of MSU. It doesn't mean that all of your classes are small. Yes, you're gonna have class sizes that are small. We're not, in our college, we average 10 to um, 20, depending on the course, but you're still gonna have some classes that look like this, those traditional lecture classes. And that's because you are still an MSU student. You're still a Spartan, so you'll be taking classes that involve um, university requirements, electives, um, other courses you might want to dabble in. So those might look like this. So we want you to know that it's not exclusive to us small, but your classes in-house will look like this. Like I mentioned, um, we average about 10 to 20 and we try to keep it really small and really intimate so that you can ask for help, so that your professor does know your name, so that you do know your classmates because studies show that students tend to do better when they have a smaller learning environment. But we are, like I said, we are a part of Michigan State. Um, we have students who are in the marching band. We have students who participate in study abroad at Michigan State. In fact, I believe our college has the largest percentage of study abroad, uh, students who participate in study abroad out of the whole university. Um, so that's something that we're very proud of. We tell our students to go beyond our walls, to go beyond our, um, our resources and to really explore everything that is there. And we take pride in the fact that we are a, a home for our students. And when you're an ARCA student and when you're in the space and when you're interacting with somebody, this idea of home is really real and it's it's something you feel. So we try to explain it as best as possible in a presentation like this, but I'd love to um, show students who are interested in a program like this, that home feeling. So once everything clears up and we're back in person, I would love to um, provide students with the opportunity to see what we mean when we talk about this small, tight-knit home community. But I'm going to try to do my best to explain it all here. Um, so what we do in the Residential College of the Arts and Humanities is we prepare students. We, we give you a set of skills. You explore all the things you're interested in. We push you to think beyond the limitations of what we've been taught to think as a society, as a school system, as an education system. And we push you to do that in the classroom and outside of the classroom. And what we don't do is we don't try to limit students. We don't try to box students. So it's really a space for students who want to get the support that they need, but really explore a lot of different things. And what I mean by that is you'll often hear like there's one major, um, for example, accounting becomes an accountant, journalism becomes a journalist. And so we really try to think outside of that and say, what skills do, do people need to be successful? Um, what do they want to learn? What do they want to contribute to the world and provide a learning environment for students in that? As far as academics go, um, we are unique in the sense, so there's a couple of ways we're unique, right? We're a residential college, which is a living learning community, and there's only three of them at Michigan State. But we're also unique because we only have one major. It's a Bachelor of Arts in Arts and Humanities. Other colleges that you'll hear from will have multiple majors within a residential college or, or a non-residential college. But for us, it was really important to create that one interdisciplinary major that all of our students could benefit from. So what that means is we look at a couple of them they're going to sound familiar arts humanities those are in our name but we also look at community engagement and we also look at language and cultures and together that's really where you get our college 
Now, um, these are the pillars of our college. So regardless of having the one major, students will, and students will take classes in all of them, but they'll pick one as their focus. So if a student is really interested in the humanities, they will focus on the humanities. If a student's really interested in community engagement, that's where they'll focus on, so on and so forth. So for us, when we say a broad liberal arts degree, it encompasses all four of these with allowing students to pick their specific pathway within it. And so with that, we also say there's no two ARCA students who have the same exact experience because of how much you can cater and mold it to yourself and your interests. I'm gonna dive into those pillars a little bit. So arts is really any form of creative outlet, whether that be graphic design, film, dance, theater. And these are classes that we teach in our college. So we're not an art school, we're not a humanities school, but we do have classes that focus within each of those. We focus on the humanities, so history, religion, philosophy, um, ethics. We have historians in our college, we have philosophers in our college that teach specific courses that are related to these humanities fields. So language and culture, students might often think of this as taking like Spanish or taking French or taking German. And yes, we do encourage our students to take a language and to learn a language because we know that student, uh, students who do that have um, better skills with working with different types of people. But when we say language and culture within our college, we teach courses that teach cultural competency. So to teach you how to be bridge builders, how to work with somebody who looks different than you, how to work with somebody who's is different than you. What does it mean to be culturally competent? These are the classes that focus on that. And then we also uh, teach community engagement. So almost all the classes you'll take in college and um, you know, within ARCA as well are gonna be learning in the classroom. Our community engagement classes are actually you going into a community with a professor and learning what it means to be hands-on involved and trying to solve a problem with members of the community. So these focus on education, social justice, change, uh, nonprofit work, any form of, um, you can think of quote unquote helping people, this is what that is. How do we work with others? How do we apply what we're learning within the arts, within the humanities and within uh, language and culture into actually problem solving? Um, so a lot of times students are like, okay, this is great. I love the concept of taking a bunch of different things that I'm interested in. Um, and applying it to one college because I talk to students and I say, okay, what are your interests? They might say English, but also history, but also art. So for us, this program is really great for students who like a lot of different things and want to combine it into one program. If a student told me I'm solely interested in uh, English, then I would say maybe an English major is a better fit, but students who really want to get that interdisciplinary um, study, this would be a great fit. So they would, they would think, okay, this is great. I have a space where it's small enough for me to learn successfully. Um, people, as cliche as it sounds, somewhere where people know my name and people can support me individually with my needs and my um, my expectations of what I want from a college degree. And I have the Big Ten resources and I can create my own curriculum. But what can I actually do with this degree? Where can I apply it? So I want to take some time to talk about that. Um, first of all, we have a 100% placement rate in our college, which is huge. This means that every single student who's graduated from our college within the last seven years has directly gone into the working field, started a business, or has gone into graduate school. This is huge because we don't want to play to that stereotype of, okay, or where, what are you gonna do with this? Or how does English apply? Or how does art apply? We want to do, display that these skills are important and that they can be applied to the real world. And our students are demonstrating that by doing amazing things with this degree. Because when you ask employers what they're looking for um, in students, they're gonna say somebody who can communicate really well and somebody who can work with other people really well. Our students learn those skills in the classrooms by taking the things they're interested in. And so let's break it down into what those um, areas of employment are. A little bit about graduate school. So we have students who go to law school. We have students who go to medical school, believe it or not. We have students who go to various uh, master's and PhD programs as well. And then we have some students who start their own businesses. The, st the students that start their own businesses after graduating are the very creative students who can do film um, production or graphic design, students who really wanna take 
that applied um, creation of art and market it and sell something with it. So those are our very creative students. But the students who go directly into the working field, these are the major areas we've seen them go into now. This doesn't mean they're tied to it, but these are just some examples of what we found when we um, when we track our graduates and say, what are they doing? So education is a really big one. This could mean potentially teaching in the classroom, um, but this could also mean after school programs or education access. Um, Emily is a really good example. She runs an after school program for Chicago called After School Matters, where she works with 15,000 students every single day, making sure that the after school program is catered to them. We have people who go into social and community services. So this could potentially mean nonprofits. This could mean uh, community organizing. Julia runs a um, year-round farmer's market in a neighborhood here in Lansing, uh, which is huge because she's helping bring fresh produce, uh, farm, farm produce to people who might not have access to grocery stores because grocery stores are so sporadic here in Michigan and specifically in Lansing. We have people who go into politics and communication. So uh, Sean works for New York City as a um, land use policy director, which essentially his job is to figure out how to best utilize space in New York City. Um, we have people who go into communications. Again, with a degree where you're really learning how to be a good a good communicator, a good uh, producer, whether it be like um, media production or something like that, you're gonna have the skills of a communicator. Um, so Hannah is the, I believe she's actually um, the director now, not the manager. I should, should have updated this, but um, she is the manager for the, Na communications manager for the National Forest Foundation. We have people who go into health and science and then business as well. Health and science could mean, like I mentioned, um, medical school, but more so maybe like community health. So Matt um, has his own clinic of um, their therapy clinic in his hometown. We also have people who go into clinical therapy or social work therapy or types of um, um, help back within their communities. And then um, business as well. So you don't need a business degree to work in business, um, especially when you're learning skills such as like digital creation that could easily be applied to advertising or marketing or things like that. Virginia is the senior manager of sustainability for Nike. So essentially her job is to figure out um, how to best apply Nike's profits back in the community, what materials are best to use, um, so things like that. We have people who go into media and art administration. So Emmanuel Barry works for um, a podcast. Podcasts have been existing for a long time, but they're newer to us uh, as millennials and as, as Gen Z. Um, but she um, is a producer for Gimlet Media. So if you're interested, I'd really recommend The Nod. It's produced by her. And then we have people who go into art and art administration. Um, so Augusta works for the Museum of Contemporary Art in Detroit as an education associate. I give these examples of these people, uh, the, these specific alumni, to show the various ways that this degree can be applied, um, and that you're not boxed in, and that you're not um, quote unquote like hollowed out into one path that really the world is there and you can explore the things you want to do with the thing with the passions you have and apply that to big picture and i think currently when we're facing a lot of COVID issues and where we're facing a lot of community dilemmas and problems, the humanities comes into a big play with that. What is ethical? What is sustainable? Who is this affecting? How can we help it? How can we change the world? Those are the questions that our students and our alumni have been trying to answer since the beginning of our college, but even so more apparent now um, because we are in this quote unquote crisis mode. So, oops. So why ARCA? We think it's a great space for students to really thrive. We have these spaces, the art studio, the language and media center. This is part of the living learning community, part of the residential college. These spaces are there for you as a student. So the this is our lookout gallery. Um, we bring in artists, we bring in humanitarians, we bring in people who are doing arts and humanities work out in the real world to our college so that students can be exposed to it, so they can learn from it, so they can build their network. 
We offer study abroad programs within our college. So as an MSU student, you can participate in any study abroad that is available, but we also have our own in-house one to Costa Rica that focuses on community engagement and sustainability. We have um, programs that allow you to work with locals here in Lansing. This is a picture from a, from a, a program called Globe Camp where we worked with Lansing's um, refugee students and creating um, books that allowed them to show their own self-portrait and their own stories. We have a really small, tight-knit community, and this is a picture of uh, our dean uh, rented out Mun Ice Arena, and everyone was able to participate and come and skate for a few hours. And then we, you have a collection of staff and faculty who are really there to support you individually because we know that every single student's need is different than somebody else's, so we really want to provide that individual experience. And then you get to forge your own path. You get to take your interests and apply that to your college experience and then further into potentially a career or changing the world. And then for us, it's really simple. We want to make it as easy as possible for students to be in this program if this is something they are passionate about. So you apply to Machine State and you select Arts and Humanities as your major. We're a first come, first serve basis, um, but we work with students if they are interested in the program to make sure that they um, get the opportunity to come. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sahar. I'd now like to turn things over to Jerrica Lee over in Lyman Briggs. Jerrica. Hi, all. Uh, my name is Jerrica Lee, and I am a recruiter and academic advisor for Lyman Briggs College. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, how Lyman Briggs College, the science residential college at, and at Michigan State, um, can really kind of help you and guide you um, into this into furthering your science education. Um, so some of my colleagues in the um, other residential colleges broke down a little bit about how these um, degree granting colleges really work at Michigan State. And so this slide kind of depicts a little bit um, of that in, a, in, in the physical sense, right? So um, at the top, you'll see all those tiny little gray buildings of the other 15, the, I'm sorry, uh, the other 14 degree granting colleges. Um, that kind of play into that. And then at the bottom, you'll see the three residential colleges. You'll see all of us and what our buildings kind of cartoonish look like um, into that type of type of aspect. Um, one thing I will note that if you are interested in any of the three residential colleges, um, you are more than welcome to do um, two, all three of us, you know, it's really up to you um, if you want to do that. Um, but certainly, of course, you'll always want to keep in contact if you do want to do another residential college or all three of us. You'll just want to keep in contact with um, with um, either one of the recruiters, all the recruiters, just to make sure um, that everything is being all kind of good there at that sense. So um, Lyman Briggs College and what we are. Um, so we are a residential college for students who are interested in science, um, but specifically um, students who are interested in science, but also want to be able to see the connection between how what you do in science connects to the social sciences and the humanities portion of, um, of that science. So then that way that can make you a better scientist at the end, because not only are you um, being able to have the ability to understand and learn about everything that you're doing, but you're also able to see the connections and the greater impacts about what you're doing in science can affect um, kind of society and everything else around you. Right, especially what, whether that be positive or negative. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit later. You'll see a slide that kind of really, I think, depicts that a little bit better. Um, so why Lyman Briggs, right? So what are the, some of the benefits? I think just like many of my colleagues have already mentioned, being a part of a residential college gives you that availability for a smaller class size. So at Lyman Briggs, we accept about 600 um, incoming first year students. Um, we only accept at the incoming first year level. OK, um, and that allows us to have a cohort type of model for our students um, in which um, students who are interested in studying math and science can live in an area um, in Holmes Hall. We're on the east side of um, campus um, that can kind of work together as well as. Did I freeze?
Okay. Do I need to start over? <laughs> Okay, um, I'm just gonna start over. Uh, I don't know if that's best. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay. Thank you, Molly. So hi all, uh, my name is Jerrica Lee. Uh, I am an academic advisor and recruiter for Lyman Briggs College. Um, and I'm here to talk a little bit more about Lyman Briggs College as well as like the residential college and that science experience um, for that. Um, so like previously, um, my colleagues kind of mentioned a little bit about the, um, to how the setup for the degree granting colleges are here at Michigan State. And so this kind of gives a little bit of that kind of um, understanding. So in those gray buildings, you'll see the other um, colleges, and then at the bottom, you'll see the three residential colleges. Um, if you'd like to do more than one residential college, you are more than welcome to do um, one. You can do two, you can do three, and you know you can do all of us. So it's really up to you. We just ask that um, if you choose to do more than re one residential college, um, that you keep in contact um, with each of us as recruiters. So then that way, um, we just know um, on our end um, to ensure that nothing kind of uh, kind of slows down in your process when it chooses for other things kind of later in the end. So just making sure um, that we are getting to that um, as well. So Lyman Briggs College. So like I mentioned, we are a science residential college at Michigan State University. Um, but at the same time, we do that with our own little twist. Um, we do a science residential college, but we also um, have a connection for students with the kind of social sciences and the humanities type of blend. So then that way students are able to see and build their connections of not only what they're learning in science, but how that can affect kind of the, the rest of uh, society. And you can see the rest of that impacts um, through what you're studying. So um, I have a later slide that kind of depicts that a little bit better, um, but we like to kind of um, have our own spin and have our own take for science classes. Um, so why, why Lyman Briggs College? So um, as a residential college, um, we do also have a cap. Um, we accept about 600 or so incoming first year students. Um, we only unfortunately right now accept students at the incoming first year level, uh, but this helps us kind of create a cohort type model um, for our students. Right, because they're living within our residence hall in the first year. So they're living in Holmes Hall their first year altogether. 
um, which allows them to really take their core classes all together um, when they are within our building because all of their classes are right downstairs um, and they can use kind of each other as resources and anything like that when it comes to um, uh, Lyman Briggs in that sense. So uh, there's that portion as well as, you know, all of your suite mates and everything else like that would typically be taking the same classes as you. Um, so that kind of continues to build that community of like-minded students and students who are interested in studying the same things, um, same aspects of you um, as well. So because of our limited class size, um, just like all the other residential colleges, uh, we do have smaller class sizes. Um, I will mention that uh, we are probably, we are the largest residential college. So our class sizes might be a smidge bigger than some of the other, some of the other two residential colleges. Um, but at the same time, it's not that much bigger. So um, I will know our largest class is, a, is about a hundred. And I will say coming from high school, I know that seems large, but I think on MSU's campus, that's still relatively small. Um, um, that's general chemistry um, for our students. Um, but at the same time, it will get progressively smaller. Um, labs usually cap out about 28 students or so, um, which is really great because you get that one-on-one -on -one connection um, with your faculty members too. So even though we have a classroom set of, you know, our largest class being at 100, you still have direct access to faculty members. So um, your faculty members are the ones teaching your classes. Um, they're also the ones who are going to be facilitating that discussion for you as a student. And so that way you can kind of build off of them as well as understand um, what they are really trying to get at for your sciences. And they want you to think a little bit deeper. That goes back into that humanities kind of socio, so, uh, societal type of impact that we have here at Lyman Briggs that we want you to understand. And you're gonna see that flow um, throughout um, our college and throughout your science classes. At the same time, that direct access to faculty members also create a a really great pipeline to undergraduate research. Um, I know for scientists and for students who are interested in studying science, uh, research can be a huge factor within that as well. And so we start that off with all of our classes. Our students are challenged um, to think of their own research projects um, within a group. Sometimes they have a budget um, and they have to work within those budgets and that's a learning process for them too. Um, but this also gives them that ability to um, see what that whole process of research looks like all the way down from the nitty gritties of developing a research question, all the way down to presenting that. Um, we have a Lyman Briggs Research Symposium every single spring in which our students can present on their research um, because we find that it has equal value um, because at the same time, like if you can't talk about your research, what's the point in doing that research? So we want you to be able to do that. Um, and many of our students go off into the university undergraduate research and art form, also known as URAF. And so many of our students often go off to present um, to a larger university at the same time because of the preparation that we've done at Lyman Briggs. Um, also, another thing is that we also have academic advisors. So myself and my um, six colleagues who are um, academic advisors, we are here for you. Um, we are located in the garden level of Holmes Hall, um, also known as a, a basement. Um, but at the same time, we're there for you to kind of um, ask questions, help plan out your time to graduation, help you find resources, anything and everything. We as academic advisors are there to help you. Um, so other academic resources. So on every single floor within Holmes Hall, we have um, we have learning lounges. Um, they're run by our undergraduate learning assistants, so ULAs. Um, those are those are students who have been successful in that class before, um, who are a, part, a key part of our teaching team at Lyman Briggs and are able to uh, and work very very closely uh, with a, with our faculty members. But they're running our learning lounges. Um, they're um, so then that way if you need help in calculus, you need help in um, chemistry, you need help in biology. They're there to help you. Um, at the same time, we have lab spaces. Um, and something that's really unique to, to us is that we have a makerspace. Uh, what is a makerspace? That's kind of a, a new unique term, but a makerspace for us in Lyman Briggs truly means that you can make whatever type of scientific thing that you are thinking of come to life. Um, whether that be using a 3D printer, whether that be using an Oculus, so the 3D virtual reality, you wanna learn to sew, um, there's a sewing machine down there. So there's a lot of different things that you as a scientist can really kind of uh, kind of bring to forward so then that way you can see it in that 3D kind of in-person module as well. 
Right. Um, and then we also have a career consultant. So um, like every other college here at MSU, there is a career consultant, but our career consultant does work with our students. We have a um, obviously with having smaller, uh, smaller class size and a smaller college, we're able to see more of our students and meet with them one on one. But at the same time, she's also going to bring our Lyman Briggs alumni. So students who have gone through the same process within Lyman Briggs to campus to Holmes Hall. So then that way our students can interact with them as well ask them questions um, and those types of things um, as well as doing holding workshops and all that other types of good stuff um, so for us in Lyman Briggs we are um, also around 95 percent um, graduation rate about half of those students will go off into some type of graduate school or a pre-professional school and the other half will go into um, into the workforce. Uh, many of our students um, who go to graduate school or pre-professional school, many of them often find them going into an MD program, a DO program, a, a dental school, vet school, anything like that, optometry school. A lot of our students will move forward into that type of um, kind of the medical health profession field as well. So I mentioned our humanities portion for that, um, for Lyman Briggs. Um, we do that through teaching of history, philosophy, and sociology of science, also known as HPS. Um, I think the biggest factor, and I think this picture kind of takes, um, takes that to heart, in that um, we want you to think about science in a, in a realistic way, but then we also want you to be able to see what the, what the overall societal impact looks like. Uh, kind of like Jurassic Park, right? Yeah, dinosaurs are really cool, but is that smart, right? Um, so it's a lot of that type of stuff that we want you to think critically of. And it's not just specifically, you know, just in this type of technology sense. We want you to think about it in environment, um, whether that be women and gender or the medical and health field, um, or even, like I said, technology. So there's a lot of different topics that we do um, through the study of science. Um, and yes, we do have particular coursework in this that we ask our students to study. Um, but at the same time, um, you will be seeing it wo woven in through some of your other biology and chemistry and all that other types of curriculum as well. So this is our Lyman Briggs coursework. Um, we ask all of our students and we have um, these type of core foundational classes that our students will be taking. Um, it'd be chemistry, um, biology and physics, and then mathematics with Calc 1, Calc 2, or Calc based statistics, um, our history, philosophy, and sociology of science, um, and then a senior seminar. Um, senior seminar, it's kind of this, um, it sounds kind of strange and ambiguous, but at the same time, it is one particular topic that our seniors can kind of study and, and learn about um, if they have a particular question. And they can do that within an even smaller classroom. Usually it's about 15 or 16 students, and you work with that specific profess professor about that. Another way that students um, kind of gain credit for senior seminar is by studying abroad. In Lyman Briggs, we have, our, um, have a few study abroad programs where students can earn credit in, um, whether that be in Europe, Australia, um, and all that other places. Uh, I think we also have one in Africa. So there's a lot of different places that our students can earn, as well as go learn, learn and kind of study abroad in that sense um, for credit. Um, something unique that you may not notice um, through our Lyman Briggs coursework and through our curriculum is that we, in two of our classes, um, we actually have lab built in. So in our biology and physics courses, we have lab built into your classes. You don't need to sign up separately. Um, that is part um, in that we are able to do that because of our smaller class sizes. But the biggest thing is that um, we do that because we want you to be able to see the woven connections of what you're doing within biology or physics or anything else like that. That's not to say that chemistry doesn't see that kind of woven into, um, but it's just easier for us to kind of separate that out because we have more students um, within chemistry. Um, also something pretty unique to our physics course is that um, it is a biology based type of physics, um, which is pretty unique for many of our students because they sometimes aren't able to see the connection between physics and to the rest of the science fields. And so we're able to kind of teach that for our students, have that uh, curriculum and woven into um, biology and whatnot. 
So you see the Lyman Briggs College curriculum, we make about make up about 48 to 52 credits. Um, overall, MSU, you need 120 credits to graduate. Um, and that's made up by your majors, your minors, um, and temp any type of university classes, as well as any type of extra uh, um, electives that you might want to take. Um, we do also accept AP and IB and dual enrollment credits as well to kind of cover for our classes. So no worries on that step as well. Um, so for our majors, um, so we uh, the nice thing about being a part of Lyman Briggs is that we give you that core foundational classes, um, but we the, we are able to coordinate all of our majors with the other colleges across campus. So um, you know you're able to not only be a Lyman Briggs student but be uh, a human biology in in the college in another college in College of Natural Science. So we have a really strong partnerships um, with other colleges like CNS, College of Natural Science, College of Engineering, as well as College of Ag and Natural Resources. Okay, um, and this allows us to put on a variety of different majors, our 39 different majors. Um, you'll also note that we have four majors of our own. Those are listed in green um, in that kind of bolder box um, for that as well. So those are Lyman Briggs specific and only Lyman Briggs students can do that. We also offer minors within our college um, too, as well as some teaching degrees if you're looking for secondary education um, for Lyman Briggs. Um, so something I think really, really unique um, to Lyman Briggs um, is our partnerships. So we have a partnership with the College of Osteopathic Medicine um, in which we, you as a Lyman Briggs student can earn a DO in seven years. So a three plus four program. This is a separate application from your MSU application, okay, um, that you have to apply into two different places. So you'd apply through your MSU application and you would apply through the Osteopathic Medical Scholars Program. Um, so their, their application is open now. It is on their website through the OMSP. And if you are a Lyman Briggs OMSP student, you are then eligible to do this three plus four program. Typically, um, in order for consideration for the OMSP program, um, they do want a GPA, high school GPA of a 3.0 or higher. Um, because um, MSU is test, uh, test optional this year, they are also test optional, but they will still accept the ACT and SAT and will be and would like to see the score if you have it. If you don't, that's okay too. They'll still evaluate you on whatever you have. Um, they do. They would ask for a record of volunteering and community service. Um, Again, with pandemic, I know that can look a little bit different this year, but if you have it, again, they want to see it. But I think the biggest thing to note is that they um, do a holistic review. They want to know why you want to go into a DO program. Um, early on and why and what you plan on doing with that DO. So this is a really unique program. It's a really great partnership that we have um, with the with the College of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, most times than not, students students have to major in biology if they want to do the three plus four program. But that's something as an advisor we'll talk about later as you go into the program um, once you enter into MSU. Um, so admins in an, into the OMSP program is not admissions to MSU or vice versa. So these, just like the application is separate, um, the admittance process is also separate. So just note that as well, okay? And like I said, I can't stress this enough. Students uh, must be a part of um, Lyman Briggs in order to qualify for the three plus four admissions program, okay? So just making sure that that's something um, to note as well. Um, and just like all the other residential colleges, if Lyman Briggs is something that you're interested in doing, um, you know, on your major for your MSU application, you just list Lyman Briggs. Um, we are first come, first serve, just like all the other residential college programs. Um, and so that's just something to know. Um, always something to kind of, if you're interested in our program, you know, always kind of start off with us for applying. And you can always make that transition if you decide that it's not the place for you. Um, you know, I think that's the biggest fit. Biggest thing is just making sure that you're finding your right fit and finding your right place. Um, if you have any further questions or anything like that, please, please, please do not hesitate to contact me um, through our kind of email of lbc.recruiting at msu.edu. Um, all right. So thank you so much, everyone, for listening to and joining in on this on tonight's presentation. Um, on behalf of everyone who presented today, we really, really thank you for listening and thank you for joining us. Um, and we are all more than happy and, will, and uh, more than willing to help you on your college search process journey. So please, again, do not hesitate to reach out to any of the kind of partners who presented today. Um, and yeah, so thank you so much and go green.